As we trudge along in this era of gaming, it seems like we're getting deeper and deeper into the weeds of AAA games being forced to become either live service slop or single player games that feel like they have to be these giant filmic masterpieces. Nowadays, it's really refreshing to get a video game that's just proud of being a video game. Now enter Yakuza, a stubborn little game franchise that's dug in its heels and refused to change, even after exploding in popularity these last couple of years. After like 18 entries and 20 years worth of making these video games, Yakuza has stayed true to his roots, and that is exactly why it's so beloved. Now, I'll be the first to admit, when I first played Yakuza Kiwami, I fucking hated it. I thought it was self-indulgent nonsense uh, that was way too slow to get going. I was like Squidward glaring out the window watching everyone else have fun with it, while I just had no idea what people saw in it. Like, like, dude, what, what the hell are people so in love with this game for? Then, you know, around like 2018, 2019, I started to see like uh, these memes floating around and stuff. Majima and Kiryu disco dancing. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty funny, I guess. Then I see Kiryu start to sing his heart out with karaoke. I'm like, Okay, what I mean, what the hell is this game, right? And I was like, you know what? This is definitely like the game I played. First hour of Kiwami, I was like, man, this shit was boring as hell. Then I see shit like cabaret management and real estate tycoon games. And I'm like, all right, you know what? I'll give this game one more shot. And that's where it all started. The world was so enamoring, the story was so gripping, the combat was so damn satisfying. The mini games, oh my god, the mini games were so damn addicting. I don't know what Switch flipped in my brain, but I was hooked from that moment on. It's really like no other video game that I've ever played. So what makes Yakuza so goddamn good? And what is this winning formula of basically releasing the same game for the last 20 years? Well, uh, let's get to it. For most of Yakuza's life, the game has been beat-em-ups. So like 80% of the time, all you're doing is obliterating Yakuza members. Unlike a lot of beat-em-up franchises, the combat has evolved a ton. There's the OG engine for Yakuza 1 through 4. There's the Kiwami engine used for Yakuza 0, Kiwami 1, and 5. The Dragon engine used in Yakuza 6, Kiwami 2, and Gaiden. And finally, the turn-based games, Like a Dragon and Infinite Wealth. The OG version is pretty much what you'd expect out of an early PS3 era beat-em-up game. It's the foundation for every game's combat going forward. Kiryu's canonical fighting style was known as the Dragon nice. of Dojima. A slower paced street brawler style of fighting that utilizes hefty punches, grabbing, and kicks used as combo finishers. Admittedly, Yakuza 3 was pretty shitty on the combat front, even for its time. What in fuck's name are you doing? There's an extreme lack of combos, and your attack damage pretty much does nothing to these enemies. There's like double combo finishers that you can unlock, but other than that, I mean, there's there's not really much going for it. But I cut the old games from slack because, you know, they're foundational pieces for what's to come. Yakuza 4 adds a lot of depth by actually giving you four protagonists, all with different combat styles. The swung his body to the side. Transitioning from combat in Yakuza 3 to Yakuza 4 is literally like night and day. Like, Yakuza 3 feels fucking impossible to play at times, just with how Fuck annoying it is. Shit. While Yakuza 4 is bordering on extremely easy. Enemies are like super conservative with their attacks. They pretty much don't block at all. They just let you smack them right in the face. Plus with four different protagonists in the game, the pacing of progression speeds up immensely. You'll level up insanely quickly since the game wants to keep all characters equally skilled. So now we're in the Kiwami engine days and Yakuza 5 is pretty much the same as Yakuza 4 with the multiple fighting styles. When I mean, you see little flashes here and there of what the series would become, the basic combat itself feels way more refined. The attacks are super crunchy and powerful, and the animations are redone to look 10 times better. Now we're on to the glorious Yakuza 0, and this game is really where the combat peaked in my opinion. Since the game is a prequel, Kiryu and Majima are very young, so their fighting techniques are still pretty unrefined. They both have three distinct fighting stances they cycle between that feature moves that would eventually be incorporated into their main fighting style. It's a genius way of reinventing a combat system that was starting to look outdated. It takes everything great about the fighting in 5 and condenses it into two main characters. Kiwami 1 is pretty much a copy and paste of Zero, but they gamify some perks to make the combat flow even smoother, like instant style switching and not needing heat to speed up and rush. After 10, ten years, years in the, in the joint, joint made you a fucking pussy. Kiryu actually forgets his dragon style, and Majima is determined to have Kiryu remember it by fighting him over and over and over and over again. If it wasn't for the extremely fucking annoying bosses in Kiwami 1, negating the progression of styles because guns go burr, it would honestly be my favorite combat system over Zero. 
With the release of Yakuza 6 and Kiwami 2 came the brand spanking new shiny dragon engine and all its buggy glory. The extreme bugginess and unoptimized version of this engine honestly kind of worked for these games. Yeah, I mean the 30 FPS, is, it's a little annoying, but the, just the crunchiness of how the game runs really makes fights feel like dirty, fucking real street fights, you know what I mean? A huge difference from the super polished, rigid version of the Kiwami engine. Now I'll admit, the transition to Yakuza 6 or Kiwami 2, depending on which one you play first, it is a little rough. Combat is slimmed down to just one fighting style again, but it really shines on just how absolutely ridiculous it can be. Combat in the Dragon Engine is all physics based, so it just gets completely absurd. It really allows the game to add things like, uh, you know, ragdoll physics, environmental damage, new grappling moves that really added an entire new layer to the combat that the old games couldn't get. Kiryu's just throwing people through glass. He's fucking kicking them so hard they'll fly 20 yards away. I mean, for God's sakes, Kiryu we could just pick up a guy and fucking swing him around like a pillow. It's, it's crazy. He's destroying entire convenience stores. Kiryu looks like he has super strength in this game because of how goofy and fanciful it is. To upgrade Kiryu, you use a Feeder King mechanic huh? where you make him eat as much as possible and uh, you pretty much just gain skill points for it. Kiwami 2 is pretty much the same as 6 combat wise, uh, except it's a little bit more balanced in favor of the enemies because you do tend to get a little OP, except for this motherfucker right here, man. You gotta this kill guy. yourself. You can't get a single fucking combo on this guy unless you have a weapon. Kiwami 2 also gets rid of the triple quick step and the drop kick, so it's a little bit lighter in terms of the basic combat, but it adds way more heat actions. So now we're on to the more modern releases, and in my opinion, they're honestly the pinnacle of what a beat em up game can be, especially Gaiden. It literally takes the best part of every combat system and just makes it run in a buttery smooth FPS. Like it's fantastic. The hitboxes are just super precise. Uh, the attacks are super colorful and eccentric. Overall, the Dragon Engine started out super fucking buggy, but once it got polished, it really became one of the best engines in the game industry right now. But all of these games combat systems are all tied together by the game's core mechanic, heat actions. Heat actions are special moves that play out like cutscenes and just do massive damage to the enemy. Heat actions include stomping on faces, throwing someone's head against the wall, punching their face directly into the concrete, jumping on them with a bike, taking their fucking gun from them and shooting them in the stomach. Kiryu doesn't kill though. Rolling someone into an actual fucking snowman. Like they just, they just get completely ridiculous and they're so much fun to use. It fits in perfectly with Yakuza's gameplay of just having absurd moments just for the sake of having fun. But here's where it gets interesting. Because going back to 2020, with the release of Like a Dragon, Yakuza for some reason just got turn-based. Beat him up. No more. I am turn-based. Everyone's thinking the same thing, right? How could a studio that has just gotten so good at making beat em up games do a hard pivot into a turn-based RPG and still make a great combat system? I don't know how, but they did. The basic premise is uh, Ichiban's overactive imagination uh, makes him go on a complete schizoid rampage where he thinks he's a hero in a Dragon Quest game along with all of his party members and all of the enemies are like shadows from Persona 5 where they magically transform into super evil villains in costumes. <laughs> Just like Final Fantasy, they have jobs. Uh, they got the buffs, the debuffs, you know, all that good stuff. But what really makes it stand out is the interactivity of it all. Almost every attack or defense that you do comes with a QTE that will either protect you or add more damage. Although I will say, once you figure out the winning formula, it does start to get a little repetitive, right? Like you're just using the same attacks, you're doing the same defenses. But I cut out a lot of slack because it's a great combat system and it was RGG's first turn-based system. And a lot of those kinks were ironed out in infinite wealth. There's an entirely new moveset, there's no difficulty spike. There's a range of motion that allows you to move all around the battlefield and take advantage of powerful attacks and environments damage. They really managed to streamline this combat system into something really, really good in just two games. Overall, in the Yakuza series, while the combat has been sort of simplistic, now that we're in this era of like turn-based combat, it has gone a lot smoother than I would have thought. And honestly, I kind of think the combat systems are equal in terms of quality at this point. Just wanted to update everyone. We are on the verge of taking out all the ops. So this is big stuff here. And um, let's hope we get it done soon. Appreciate you. As we saw from the combat, Yakuza is a ridiculous franchise filled with hilarious action that overall doesn't really take itself too seriously. But the main stories in this game are pretty much the complete opposite from everything else. They're still absolutely ridiculous. Don't get me wrong. 
but just in a different way. A way that isn't rooted in surrealism, but in the soap opera style of writing. It's an ultra melodramatic style of storytelling that's both grounded in how it depicts its characters and also completely over the top with its plot development. The stories are quite literally just nonsensical soap operas filled with archetypes like betrayals, people coming back from the dead, conspiracies, femme fatales, moral ambiguity. But instead of housewives or fucking doctors, it's about mafia members. Its utilization of storytelling tools like surprises, cliffhangers, and plot twists can start to get eye rolls at times as you need to suspend your disbelief heavily to follow the plot, but by God do they keep me on the edge of my seat. I've played every single game in this series, and you know, while the quality may vary here and there, I've never run into a Yakuza game where I am not deeply invested in the plot. It is truly what made me fall in love with the franchise. At its core, it's really just a serialized crime drama but disguised as an action game. We'll use Kiwami 1 as an example of what I'm talking about. It's a quaint story in hindsight, but even so, it's just ridiculous in the amount of over-the-top writing they have. Kiryu takes the rat for his best friend, Nishikiyama, killing your patriarch to protect your childhood love interest, Yumi. But when you get out 10 years later, you find out he's evil, Yumi is missing, and 10 billion yen is stolen from the Tojo clan. Not only that, but the leader, Sarah, is dead. Kazuma, your dad who's not your dad, gets shot by Nishiki after he reveals that Yumi actually stole the money. Detective Date helps Kiryu escape, and the Tojo declares them enemies. You find Haruka, who is the daughter of Mizuki, Yumi's sister, who everyone is after since she wears a pendant that reveals where the yen is. Kiryu learns from Kazuma that Mizuki is actually Yumi, and she just had amnesia from 10 years ago. She got married to this politician, Jingu, and had Haruka. Jingu aligned with Sarah, but after he accidentally killed a journalist that was out to blackmail him, he asked Sarah to kill Mizuki, who was actually Yumi, and Haruka. Kazuma busts in to save him just in time and confront Sarah. After this is revealed, the gang is ambushed and Kazuma dies, but not before he tells Kiryu that he made Sarah betray Jingu since he was laundering 10 billion yen to the Tojo and wanted to bribe them with it. Mizuki, who now remembers she's actually Yumi, suddenly remembers everything and intends to blow up the money. Jingu shows up with the Omi and reveals he's actually bribing them now instead. Kiryu whips out Sarah's will and reveals he's actually the new chairman. But then Nishiki shows up and surprise, he was working with Jingu the whole time to take the role of chairman, but now he just wants the 10 billion. Nishiki gets beat to a pulp, then Jingu rolls up in a helicopter and shoots Yumi. Nishiki redeems himself by killing Jingu and blowing up the tower. After being chairman for 15 minutes, Kiryu steps down, becomes a stepdaddy, and lives happily ever after. Pretty goddamn convoluted, right? It's pretty damn melodramatic and pretty much devoid of any comedy that the rest of the game is filled with. The writing is way over the top, but it's played straight. No matter how big of a twist or unrealistic of a plot point is introduced, it's never posed ironically or as tug and cheat. It's played straight and it's played with a lot of heart. The thing is, Yakuza isn't out to create some masterpiece level story that rivals the greatest screenplays ever. It's not like you're going to go into a Yakuza game and have your entire world shattered by the plot. It's campy B-movie slop, but it knows it is. It utilizes tropes that have been parodied over and over and over again in pop culture over the last hundred years, but it still takes itself seriously, and it knows exactly what it is. That's what makes it so great. I mean, sure, you can be a sniveling little nerd. Oh, you know, well, the plot twists don't make any sense. Oh, the plot pacing is bad. Oh. But at its core, you know, it's just entertaining B-movie nonsense where you're just supposed to, you know, turn your brain off, suspend your disbelief, and just have fun while the ride lasts. Masayoshi Yokoyama has been the writer of Yakuza since the very beginning. Pretty much in so many words just admits that he kind of just makes up the stories as he goes. Which, I mean, you know, to be as ballsy as he is, to just admit that, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fucking funny. I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure it's not the tactic that, uh, you know, Kojima or Druckmann uses to write their stories, but, you know, it works. The written plot itself is just a sliver of what makes these stories so entertaining in my opinion. What really sells it is a delivery of it all through these characters. There's a through line in the series that takes precedence over all the plot twists and themes. The concept of good people fighting an uphill battle for what they believe is right. A lot of the stories in Yakuza aren't about world ending, cataclysmic events, or reshaping the future of the world, but rather just about humans persevering through hardship. You spend so much time with Kiryu or Majima, Ichiban, Haruka, whoever, that you grow attached to them as characters. And since the stories are so focused on humanity, they feel relatable as people. The stories of Yakuza are the cake, and the characters are the icing that makes it all look nice and pretty. But when you're out in the open world of Yakuza, you quickly realize, like, the main story is the only thing that takes itself seriously. One stroll around Kemurocho will have you seeing just some of the most bizarre and hilarious situations possible. 
most of which come from the sub stories. Sub stories are little side quests in Yakuza that usually aren't too long and aren't voice acted. They're a nice reprieve from the main story because they're designed to be funny as fuck and get Kiryu in the most awkward situation you can think of. Like when Kiryu runs into a game developer that just needs one more voice role for his game um, and it turns out to be a yaoi game, <laughs> which is basically, eh. Uh... <laughs> With there being such an abundance of sub-stories, it makes the world feel alive by always having something weird going on in the city. Pretty much every hijinks that Kiryu manages to get himself into always starts with this, oh, I'm too old for this shit, I ain't got time for this shit shtick, right? But it quickly turns into him like genuinely having fun, helping the people of Kamurocho out, and just chalking it up to, oh, that, you know, that's Kamurocho for you. It really humanizes the main characters by showing even them that have the most shit going on, still run into the occasional wacky situation and come out of it with a heartfelt moment and a little chuckle here and there. Most of them are really just chalked up to run-of-the-mill fetch quests or even just dialogue, like nothing else but dialogue in them. But it's the writing that makes them so much fun. There's sub-stories of helping a dominatrix learn to be fall. dominant, winning a chicken at a bowling tournament and making it a manager of a business, buying an adult mag without being seen what by a group of ladies, sick. getting a guy some toilet paper, fighting circus animals. Like seriously, just, just the dumbest things you can think of. My personal favorite sub stories are the meta ones that kind of reference real life events like the sub story Yakuza Sunset 3. It's about a film director that's down on his luck because his last movie Yakuza Sunset 3 everyone just fucking hated it right. The critics were saying it had a good story, had good characters, but the combat really fucking blew. And that's pretty much the exact same sentiment that everyone had for Yakuza 3 in real life. 90% of the dialogue in this sub story is Ryu Gagodoku just being like you know I thought it was good the writing was good to me. Overall, sub-stories are just such a fun time and really add a lot to Kamurocho. Like, they're truly the heart and soul of the franchise. They're just little tiny stories in the world that are meant to be comedic and heartfelt. Sub-stories put the character in Kamurocho, which at this point in the franchise now, Kamurocho has become its own character. A lively little city filled with so many people to talk to and so much things to discover. Still, even after being used in nine different games. If I told you that one of the best game series right now involves reusing the same map nine different times, uh, you'd probably look at me like I was a fucking crazy person. But it's true. Kamurocho is a fantastic map. And it's really funny how Ryu Gaigodoku is able to get away with reusing the same map so many times. There's like other maps featured in the games, like specifically Sotenbori or Okinawa. But Kamurocho is the flagship location for Yakuza in the mecca of where the narrative of the series takes place. From an outsider's perspective, it may seem like Ryu Gaigodoku is just a lazy developer that likes to reuse assets, but the truth of the matter is, Kemurocho is a highly important part of the Yakuza franchise, and getting to know the city intimately is half of the reason why the game is so beloved in the first place. Kemurocho is almost a one-to-one -one recreation of its real-life counterpart, Kabukicho, which is only one-tenth of a square mile making it one of the smallest open world maps in gaming. Yet, what Yakuza lacks in the large world, it makes up for by filling the world with thousands upon thousands of assets, with not a dime spared on its detail. This maximalist style of design makes the world feel way bigger than it actually is. Every block in Kamurocho is filled with things to look at. Every shop sign, advertisement, LED light, poster, door, building, manhole, all just looks so damn good. It's so densely populated with so much stuff to do everywhere, but it's honestly kind of remarkable how well Yakuza runs. There's M stores and Popos, which are basically just in-game 7-Elevens that have shelves filled to the brim with snacks that have absolutely no reason looking as good as they do. It's really hard to walk around the city without just taking in the sights, like Sega shamelessly promoting themselves with their own arcade inside their own game. It's really only like five or six blocks within Tokyo, but by God, it's gonna be the most interesting map you've ever experienced. But the city in Yakuza isn't just a backdrop. It feels like a living, breathing character. We witnessed Kamurocho evolve over 20 years. The continuity across decades is incredible. Every detail is taken into account. Billboards and shop signs age. Shops close down and new ones pop up. Nothing is overlooked. Kamurocho isn't made with this Western design philosophy of needing a huge map with a see anywhere, go anywhere sensibilities. Kamurocho is a city you're meant to grow with. A place that evolves alongside the story being told. In Yakuza 0, the entire plot centers around a mystery located on an empty lot that would be the catalyst for building Millennium Tower. 
Camarocho becomes more than just, you know, a, a plot of land in which quests and collectibles can be found. It's a place you're meant to come back to and know like the back of your hand. And most importantly, it becomes a place that you can navigate without staring at your mini-map the entire time. This level of intimate knowledge with the city gives Yakuza some sentimentality. You know, after nine games, it starts to become less like a game map and more like a second home. Booting up Yakuza and walking around Camarocho, it's kind of like seeing an old friend. It's somewhere you can always come back to and spend hundreds of hours in. So when you're not in a sub story and you're not face mashing random punks in the street, uh, you're probably on the mini games. And let me tell you, these ain't your granddad's little boring old throwaway mini games with half ass implementation in them, right? I mean, these bad boys rival GTA in their level of implementation. There's a couple of different types of mini games in Yakuza, mainly being the classic bar games like pool, or darts. You also got Mahjong and Shogi, which fucking nobody knows how to play. You also got really good casino games like Blackjack, Poker, and Roulette. And <laughs> hey, Holy as a video game shit. gambling addict, I love to see these casino games and video games. They're your standard games that you can play in 50 million other games, but it's a simple arcadiness that feel like they're in the spirit of classic Sega arcade games with the satisfying sound effects and UI that makes me want to play them in Yakuza specifically. There's the batting cages, you got the golf center in Sotenbori, you got the hood classic Majara Disco, which is absolutely criminal that it's only in Yakuza 0. There's really no real way to categorize these mini games by how big or small they are because there's just so fucking many of them throughout the series. And for the most part, they've all been really solid. Fishing, noodle serving, vintage theater, taxi driving, crazy delivery, which is just crazy taxi for Uber Eats, fucking destroying little kids in pocket circuit, you name it. But where Yakuza really stands out, is that they always have at least one just like really giant sub-story minigame. They're typically canon to the protagonist and have some type of unique mechanic and a sub-story attached to them. Starting with Yakuza 0, we have Kiryu's flagship minigame, which is a real estate management tycoon. While Majima, on the other hand, has a cabaret management minigame. It involves like dressing up your hostesses and tending to their needs to get the most money out of your customers every night. They really just boil down to like menu navigators, you know? But you know, as someone who like loved tycoon games as a kid, uh, these really just scratch an itch in my brain that I can't get enough of. Sega innately understands the brain neuron activation that happens, uh, seeing that yen number just rise and rise as you build your empire up. And as the series keeps going on, it seems like RGG just makes their mini games bigger and bigger to the point where they feel like entirely different games. Like for example, Infinite Wealth has a full fucking Animal Crossing ripoff in it. And inside that is a full Pokemon ripoff. Infinite Wealth has absolutely no business being a very, very good JRPG, a really good Animal Crossing ripoff, and a competent Pokemon competitor. Kiwami 2 has cabaret management as well as a full RTS game. That RTS game is also in Yakuza 6. And it also has a baseball GM mode inside it. Like a Dragon has a Mario Kart ripoff. Yakuza 4 has Fighter Maker. You know, RGG has been consistent in making the same game for so long, but they really feel like a jack of all trades in how they're able to build such good and addicting side content. I mean, yeah, sure, we've got things like golf, strip clubs, bowling, and other open world games, right? But RGG steps it up and fundamentally changes the way you play the game with these big side games. I mean, there's definitely some stinkers in there, uh, like Shogi I mentioned before, or cat fights, which I I'm not even gonna explain what this game is. There's also the, uh, you know, the fan service games. They're pretty much just erotic mini games that only Yakuza can get away with. Most of them are pretty awkward to play. I kind of tend to stay away from them, uh, but the live chat is fucking hilarious. Junior alert. You know, though this might really be a headcanon for me, um, I feel like it's important to experience these mini games. It's completely believable that, you know, Kiryu, after just, you know, getting his ass beat, he would just go out and, like, you know, like play a game of bowling or something. And that is definitely the case for perhaps the most popular mini game of all. One that's hammered in from the very beginning, and one that's a tentpole of Kiryu's personality. And a shepherd by which we come to our last topic the music. You know, I was torn on whether to include karaoke in the minigame section or this section, but as I thought about it, I realized that karaoke would be the perfect way to wrap up this video because it truly encapsulates everything about Yakuza as a franchise. And you know, the reason why karaoke is so great, it's not because of the game mechanics, right? It's just like a simple rhythm game with a simple control scheme. It's how much dedication 
Yakuza puts into the music itself. Karaoke is a staple of Yakuza, and the games simply wouldn't be the same without it. It's not required at all in any of the games, but it's simply one of those things where when you boot up Yakuza, you have to play it at least once. You can tell that there's a lot of love put into the karaoke of Yakuza. The songs are sentimental and stand out as great music on their own. The love of karaoke actually comes from the director of Yakuza, who has sung literally 8,000 fucking karaoke songs. The karaoke of Yakuza really puts the spotlight on how fantastic the original scores are for the series. But it isn't even a fraction of what the music of Yakuza has to offer. RGG knows exactly how to implement music, and the versatility on display with the music really proves them to be masters of building emotion through sound design. The fast-paced electronic drums and basses of Funk Goes On matches the intense danger of Kamurocho, where it seems like something could pop off at any moment on any corner. Sotenbori is the classy contrast to the seediness of Kamurocho, fitting in perfectly with the stylishness of big band jazz. Cabaret Grand's jazz ensemble just emits this air of classiness that we come to know the city as. Then a fight breaks out in Kiwami 2, the Sotenbori battle music breaks out and goes with the chaotic pace of what's going on. Lullaby of Outlaws is an absurd big band avant-garde piece that matches the energy of the ridiculous fights Kiryu gets himself into, where he's throwing bikes at guys and causing thousands of dollars in property damage because three street thugs wanted to provoke him. Akiyama's battle theme in Yakuza 4, Speedstar, tells us how much fun he's having kicking the fuck out of guys with multiple fast-paced techno synths and undertones of DNB, the complete opposite of Seijima's battle theme crunchy, hard-hitting, low-tone techno rock song that sounds like what someone getting their jaw broken would sound like as a song. Between Calmness and Confusion, it's just one of many songs that plays during scenes of exposition to build tension. There's deep guitar strums and airy high-tone drums that add to the mystery of what's going on in the game, where it seems like every time you find an answer to something, you're posed with 10 more questions. Even the side content has music filled with heart and soul in it. You got the pocket circuit menu music in a dead heat, has a guitar riff that gets drilled into your brain while you spend hours min-maxing your slot car. In both Yakuza 0 and Kiwami 2, the cabaret minigame both feature R&B tracks that sound like they were exclusively written for fucking like Faith Evans or someone. There's really a classiness to its melody and a loveliness to the background chimes and the harps that are reminiscent of early 2000s R&B love ballads. It really complements the business model of a cabaret, giving rich, hopeless romantics the time of their life, and the girls in the cabaret working hard to be as glamorous as possible. There's hundreds of tracks I could talk about throughout the series, and if I did, we'd be here for hours. RGG knows exactly what type of sound is needed for every scenario in the game. Whether it be the ominous mystery music during exposition, intense action music for fighting, or goofy guitar strums to sell the comedy of a substory. Yakuza is a series I would highly recommend to anyone, even if you're not really a fan of like Japanese video games. There's a very distinct flavor in Yakuza's tight-knit style of game design that really isn't found in any other game series. It's a result of RGG sticking to their guns and doing what works for the last 20 years and honing their craft. It goes against the mainstream idea of safe open world game design. They do whatever the hell they feel like doing and they put 110% effort into it. That level of genuineness in game design is what made Yakuza explode in popularity in these last couple years and what makes it stand out so much from the rest of the game industry. It's so refreshing to see a game publisher and developer just completely simpatico in how they want to take the direction of a game series. It's a sustainable, annualized franchise. You know, it's, it's like a nice Thanksgiving dinner. I know what I'm going to get every year and I know I'm going to enjoy the hell out of it. There is truly no other game franchise that is endearing as Yakuza. From the lovable characters, to the nail-biting stories, to the addicting music, the insanely fun mini-games. And honestly, Yakuza has quickly jumped up to being one of my favorite game series of all time. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.